Hey, YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Welcome to part six of the 59 Predicta, Predicta Princess restoration. Last uh, video, we got the board back in, powered up, and we saw that we had a lack of vertical height. And the culprit seems to be the 400 volt boost line, which was only at about 100 volts. And if we come down here to the schematic, we see that the boost is derived from a winding on the flyback through a 180k resistor divided by that 100k one watt from the 275 line, which then goes up to, uh, let's see, that's 0.39, so that's your, goes up to your vertical height control. So 0.39, which is supposed to be 400 volts, is only 100 volts. Now, if we take a look uh, and look at 0.39, in the power supply, they had, I'm trying to think of where they had it here. Uh, actually, it might have been on the, uh, on here. Yeah, it is. Okay, so you have this 10 microfarad here, C3, which coincidentally is inside that can there. And yeah, I know, the little... Fusible resistor jankiness there, that's all going to change before we pop it back in the cabinets for test purposes. Everyone's looking at me like, why did he do that? Uh, so anyways, C3 or whatever it is, uh, is inside that can. Now, that can connects to this point here, which then connects back to that point there, behind the tube where the vertical is. And we only get 100 volts there. We only get 100 volts at either point and at the capacitor. So even though without disconnecting the capacitor as circuit, the ESR meter says it's good, I could also be reading through, you know, controls and other things that would bring the ESR meter reading to a false point. So my thoughts are is that either the 10 microfarad is flat out open or it's very leaky and it's pulling down that voltage because... Due to the 180K there, it's really limited on current. So a short would easily pull that high impedance down to nothing. So what we're going to do is focus on replacing all these capacitors. Uh, we've got our doubler there. We've got that multi-section there. And we've got the multi-section there. And this is all straightforward stuff that I don't have a problem with doing. So... We're first going to focus on that guy and disconnect him and see if that capacitor is either open or shorted. And by shorted, I do mean leaky, because if it was shorted, we wouldn't have much of any voltage there. So let's flip it up and see what we're getting at here. And so this lead right here on the left, this is our 10 microfarad, and the green and the other one. Not sure where they go to yet, doesn't matter, we just have to disconnect this line and figure out if the capacitor is at fault and I'm pretty dead on certain it is. Okay now here's where using an ESR meter to troubleshoot this is wrong because if we go to the 10 microfarad we see here that it has a very low ESR it looks good 10 microfarads woohoo -hoo, that's a good capacitor right? Not necessarily. So let's see what happens when we put a bigger voltage through it. Okay, so out comes our trusty WB519A with about a 23 volt battery. And we're going to see if we can charge that cap up. And as we see here, it's not charging very well. We're on R times 10K, so that's looking like about a 700K resistor right there. And it's not really charging up at all charging very slowly so that definitely indicates leakage and it's just sitting there very slowly creeping up now this was a good capacitor it would immediately charge up without there being too much of an issue in fact let me see if I have another 10 microfarad at 450 volt to compare okay so we got a 10 to 450 here and we're just going to, you can see how quickly that charges. Up and up and up and up, all the way to infinity. 
So that capacitor is definitely leaky. It just keeps going up, doesn't slow down, doesn't stall. Yeah, so <clears throat> that capacitor, definitely leaky. Uh, and if I had a cap checker or something like that that put out 400 volts, I'm sure it would fail miserably. So, this is why it's a good idea to recap these high voltage things, kids, is because the ESR meter says it's good. But, trying to charge it up against this new one, you can see the new one's almost completely charged. The old one, if we go back to the old one, probably still isn't charged yet. Oh yeah. It's doing a little better, but you can see it starts to stall out at 100. So it's leaky. It's defective. Alright, so onward to replacing that. It's not a very complicated thing either. We've got 10 at 450, 20 at 350, and 100 at 50. So the 100 at 50 is definitely a cathode bypass cap for something. Easy peasy. Alright, so I made a diagram. And I'm basically now going to bend these tabs, these FP lock tabs, so that they're uh, happy and straight. Let me get my skinnier pliers. And I'm just bending them back so that they fit through the holes right. Might take a little bit of persuasion. Long ago, I had an actual twist lock tool, but lost it. This one I'm just going to snap off because it's full of solder. And now I should be able to persuade this to come out. There we go. And so there's our old tubular cap thing. So you can have Hayseed Hamfest make you one of these. If you want to get on the waiting list, they make a great replacement. You can cut all this away and restuff it. Um, you can do terminal strips, whatever. I usually just do terminal strips, so that's probably what we're going to do here. The other thing you can do if you got a clean metal surface is you can get small value caps and you can feed them through here so long as you heat shrink the leads that are hot so that they don't have any possibility of touching the chassis. A um, whole bunch of stuff you can do really. We need to work on busting this out and getting a better terminal strip on here so this isn't flopping around. Debating whether to change the silicon rectifiers. Um, the early ones do die. Might be a good idea. Maybe something a little more heavy duty. And then this guy's pretty easy. He's just going to be a terminal strip mount. <clears throat> Same with this guy. So let's see what's going to work the best for us. Okay, so it looks like hiding a terminal strip back here is going to be our best bet. We've got enough room for everything. So we'll just wire it up and install the caps. All right, there's our tin. And there's our 22 in there. I had to extend the uh, lead a little bit, some shrink tubing there, because the old one wasn't quite long enough. And the only one that's left is the uh, 100 microfarad, which is going to go right there. And then we'll heat shrink the negative lead and pass it through with the others and then solder all that together. You can see how I got the negative lead heat shrunk here, so it'll pass by the others without risk of shorting out. Okie dokie. We got everything in here, it's all wired up. Got everything from the back side. Everything goes to its proper points. So that's one of the three cans that's done now. I guess now we can focus on replacing the uh, boost here. Just one single capacitor, so not really a big deal. And it's held in place by this clamp here. Easy enough to get rid of, so let's undo that. So that smush looking specimen is a 200 microfarad at 150 volts. And you can see it's out there with the bracket now, the wires dangling in space. I think I have one of these kicking around. Let's see. 
It looks like really all I have here is this axial version, which I'm used to putting in uh, other sets, but I think we can make this one work. All right, so that worked out pretty nice. Another terminal strip to the rescue. You can see I put a piece of stock tubing behind it to boost it up so that it wouldn't sit so damn close to the, uh, let's see, let's make everyone dizzy here, so close to the uh, cage. And then mounted our capacitor to it and wired it up. So that's that works great. So that's now two of the three cans. So now we just got to focus on this one over here. Um, and since I have a nice flat uh, area, I should be able to easily mount a terminal strip there and take up less space. And then we'll work on replacing those little old rectifiers and getting a different setup here for the surge resistor. And really, if I get rid of the surge resistor, I could probably eliminate, or uh, excuse me, if I get new rectifiers, I could probably eliminate the surge resistor because it was really just there to protect the rectifiers. But uh, it'll also soften the blow for the cathodes that are cold when you first start it up too. So yeah, maybe I'll leave it in there. So let's work on getting that resolved and then we should be good. Really the fun time is going to be removing all those wires, tracing them and marking them, and then getting something in there to undo the little ears that hold the whole can in. But I'm pretty sure that's just something we got to do. Okie dokie, she's out. Now I just need to figure out how to implement in our new ones. Okay, so here's the uh, additional part of the can that I removed out. So. Part of it's the other section of the doubler that's up there. And then we have an 80 at 450, so I've got a 100 at 450. And then we've got two 22s at 350, so that should cover the can. And as far as mounting them, I'm thinking of uh, doing something like this. Granted, it's going to be a little more precision here, but these are just going to kind of sit on top of each other like that and they're all gonna hide in there and get wired up and I think that's gonna be the best way to do it from the standpoint of uh, ease of access and whatnot and then once we get all of those wired up then we'll double check it again and, and fire it up with the fresh caps in and see if we get our full raster I think we will I think that that 10 microfarad that was a part of that can there was the reason why we were getting our 400 volts pulled down is it was leaky. So let me make some marks, mount up these terminal strips, and then we'll wire this sucker up. All right, so I got my hole drilled, and we just need to clean it up a little bit. So that's what the Dremel tool is for. So let's uh, shave that up. There we go. That's nice and flat, pretty. So let's get some hardware and mount up the terminal strips. Okay, put a little bitey washer underneath so we have a good contact with ground. And before I tighten everything down, I'm definitely going to make sure that everything we have good clearances. We're not pinching any wires, which we're not. This is going to fit nice in here. And when it's all secured, it's just going to tuck down into the cabinet. You're not going to see it. It's not going to be a problem. Um, if there is a speaker magnet here or something, then I'll have room to bend this over uh, to be over top of the doubler section here in case we have height issues. But I don't think we will on this. I think it'll be fine. It's just a matter of wiring it all up and securing it. Now, I'm not going to tighten these all down and then try to snake and finagle wires in there. That would be kind of stupid. We're going to wire everything up first, and then once everything's soldered in and happy and we know it's going to work, then we'll secure it to the chassis. Because otherwise, you're just going to waste a bunch of time. Okie dokie. So I got all this stuff wired up here. I had to make some lead extensions, obviously, for obvious reasons. Uh, reattached the chassis ground here, hard soldered to it. So now we can work on getting this down in here and bolt it up. I'm going to need two hands for that, but once we get it in and secure the nuts on it, 
tightened down, it should be good to go. All right, so everyone's in now. I've got it bolted down. We're going to put some Loctite on there. Comb out all the grounds, make sure they're happy. And then uh, we'll see about making a new mount for the uh, fusistor thing I've created here. Just so that it's a little more secure. Not really happy with that. Um, oh yeah, there is one wire I need to trace down and find an attachment for. Uh, this is a single green, so I think that's part of the 140 volt line, but we'll just attach that after I finish tracing it out. And we should be good. This fits nicely in here, and I've got plenty of room to bend over the caps if for some reason they get in the way, which I don't think they will. So let me trace that wire and attach it, and then we'll uh, deal with the fusistor thing, and then we'll fire it up. should be pretty exciting. Okay, so I was pretty much right. It was just a part of another 140 volt line, so I just attached it to the first point. Uh, so everything's cool here. I'm taking a look at the fusistor thing. You can see it's riveted down there at the bottom. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to stick this thing. I kind of want to relocate it just so that it's a, a little bit more accessible. Um, I don't know. I mean, here it's just, it's kind of janky, just because I don't like the loose feel of it. Maybe if I could secure it a little bit better. But, yeah, I don't know. Uh, i got to ponder this one. And then we're going to definitely replace the rectifiers. I'm just, I have a bad feeling about leaving them in here. And there's two more caps that I missed here. There's a decoupler to ground here that I missed, and then there's another one hiding back here by the high voltage cage, so we'll have to swap those two. But it's getting there. All right, so here it is with all the capacitors mounted up. And we got our doubler over here. And so what I've done is, as you can see, I've made some modifications here. I put a panel mount fuse holder here. And the reason for the JB well was I wanted to secure it, make sure it couldn't possibly rotate or get loose or anything and have the stuff touch uh, the uh, ch chassis here. But we've got the one end of the fusible coming up to the fuse here, the one amp fuse, and then back down through this terminal, which was unused here on the uh, doubler strip I made through the 10-ohm uh, 15-watt uh, resistor back to B so that this isn't loose and flopping around. That's going to be a lot more steady. And it also means that if there's a fault and the fuse pops, um, you do a little troubleshooting without having to pull the whole chassis out to replace the fusible. Um, but I don't encourage people to just keep putting fuses in. So what we're going to do now is put it up on the dim bulb tester and just check some voltages and then we'll hook it up to a CRT and see if uh, we get a full-size raster now. Because there's a good, a good chance that I'll have my proper voltages. But uh, until I know for certain, uh, we're going to disconnect the horizontal out, put it on a dim bulb. Uh, I'm going to hook up the vertical to uh, a load, just an 8-ohm load, so that we can simulate the yoke. So that everything's cool, and we'll see if we have our 400 volt line to the uh, vertical output stage. And very likely we will. All right, so we have our chassis laid out, horizontal outs disconnected. And let me see if I can put a meter back here so I can show you what we're getting here. And we're just going to power up with the dim bulb checker things are getting dimmer that's good i are arcing up i think this switch may need a good cleaning nope it's my uh, interlock socket Getting a little sad. Let's clean this a little bit. A 
we'll crimp it down a little bit too. I'm sure I've used this cheater cord on many a thing. Just give it a little squeeze. And we'll spray some CRC on the pins. Lights a little better. All right, take two. Let's see if I have what voltages I have. I'm going to take a 140 measurement here. Really? Oh, I had a wire break. Well, that's no good. This wire here for the 140 broke loose somewhere. All right, so I need to reattach that. One moment, we'll do that. Okie dokie, you got the wire reattached. So let's try again. I think there's something that I didn't completely solder down right. Get it dimmer. All right, let's check our 140 spot again. That's pretty high, 198. Of course, the tubes aren't conducting yet, so you can see it dropping. That's still pretty high for a dim bulb tester. Let's take a poke around in here. 156, that's a little high. And let's see here, 275. That's the 159 line. Where's my 275? That's down here. Did I get that wrong? There's only 17 volts there. All right, what's going on here? So I got 17 volts there. 158 there. That's a little high. 154 there. So something's not conducting. And we're also missing the 275 line. That ain't right. So let's see, did we screw up in getting this together? I'm sure everything's possible here. We got 80 there. And we got 160 there, so that's about right. That's your doubler. So something's going on here with one of these lines. Because I know we're not supposed to have no 17 volts there. So i got to trace that out and figure out what's going on there. Because we may have made a wiring mistake. We may have made a... Something may have not got hooked up properly. So I need to trace all that out. We're going to review that real quick and then double check this again. Because the light bulb is not very bright, but obviously we're missing some voltages. Alright, so according to this, oh, let's look at the right spot here. There we go. That big uh, 80 microfarad is supposed to come right off a choke. From one of the main rectifier diodes that's the doubler supply there it goes through that choke and right over to that 80 microfarad so is that choke open or did i just miswire it so let's uh let's own that spot out so on the top of the doubler 
where I had that 160 volts because we're on the bulb test, we're obviously not going to have 280. So I need to measure between there and the top of that capacitor there. And if we don't have a continuity, then I definitely need to take a look at that. And it could just be that that line, I misidentified that line when I disconnected it. And that's why we don't have what we're looking for. Because it's supposed to be this guy right here. And let's see now. So between the positive side of that doubler and this capacitor right here, I definitely do not have the necessary voltage or necessary uh, contact there. In fact, none of those lines go to the right spot, so I messed up there. We need to trace where this line goes because that obviously is not the one that's supposed to hook up there. All right, so pulling that line off the capacitor and tracing it out, it goes back here to the 275 volt line, which is exactly what we should be getting there, but we're not. Now, since that was the only line that was connected to that spot, my source line is where I screwed up. So I must have attached the source line somewhere else, which is probably why we're getting higher voltages than normal. So let's figure out which one of those that is. And I see something already that this line here broke off. Uh, but that goes back to our horizontal B+. So I don't think that that's part of it either because there's no other line attached to that except for that horizontal uh, line here that's kind of green striped. It's the problem with these old brittle wires is they die. So again, I have to ohm out from the high side of the doubler here and see which one of these lines that I misconnected is something. And here it is. It's one of these lines that go to the filters. And so this line down here, this bottom one, that's where we get our continuity to the top of the doubler here through the choke. So since this one here is going to the 140 volt line, the other one here, I must have uh, messed up joining those two lines together. So we'll separate them and figure out which one goes to the doubler and the other one is obviously supposed to go to the 140 volt line. All right, so separating the two lines, if we look at this one, that's 3K from the doubler. And if we look at this one, this is the one that's 40 ohms. So this is the 275 volt line right here, uh, which we need to branch off and attach separately. And then we'll reattach this, uh, verifying its proper location. And so that's probably the 140 volt line since that comes off of the uh, choke here through the 3K. Yeah, so that's the 160 volt slash 140 volt line. And then the other one comes through a 290, or excuse me, a 390 ohm one watt. So let's see if we go down here. We should be getting... That one's measuring 800 and on up, so something ain't right there either. Do I have an open resistor or something? Yeah, so that's the downside of the 3K. That's the high side of it. And then there's supposed to be a 390 ohm 1 watt resistor, which is also at the high side of that. Am I missing something here? It's just something ain't right. Yeah, I know. I'm going to shake this and make everyone dizzy. Um, so there's supposed to be a 3,000 ohm. We got that one, but the 390 ohm, we don't. So downside of that, they say it's a 255 volt source. So that's that's different. So we need to look into that too. Okay, so the three. 190 ohm was the one I replaced there because the high side of that goes right up to the top of the doubler there 
on the low side of that looks like it snakes back around behind the uh, horizontal output and ends up at that point there that horizontal B plus point which we've looked at so of course that says 426 oh yes we're adding the 40 volts on top of that okay so then this line which broke loose has to go down to uh, let's see not this filter here maybe it is is this filter that's the uh, come on that one reads open of course I haven't reattached those lines yet okay so we need to fix this um, so we need to reattach the appropriate lines and then we should be good to go okay let's see where we progressed at this point so there's top of our doubler and here is under the 390 and here is under the 3k all right so in theory we can fire this thing up now and yeah, let's see here that's going to come up as the bulb dims see kids this is why you check stuff and it's going to go up a little bit and the tubes are going to start conducting and that's going to drop a little we got 200 there it's going to drop down a little bit okay so let's go to our just under the 390, it's 175. And then if we go to our 140, it's a little low, so that's that's cool. That's what we're supposed to be getting. And check over here at the 275 by the audio, and we got 152. Yep, which is the same as the doubler right now. Okay, so all that wiring mess has been corrected. The lesson here, kids, is don't trust the wire colors. Uh, I obviously misplaced some stuff, traced it out with schematic, and we found uh, and corrected our errors, so that's good. So with any luck, let's take it off the dim bulb tester and then see what our voltages are then. All right, so let's go without the bulb tester. We're going to go full tilt. And so at the top of the doubler here, got 305 it's a little high the Sam says it's uh let's see they say 275 it's a little hot of course we don't have a full load on the set yet and all right so then let's come over to the 255 which is 290 again a little high and a 140, which is 170 high. So we're about 40 volts high. But that's because there's no horizontal sweep, there's no picture tube, there's no real load on the set. So we don't really know what the true voltages are until everything's hooked up. But everything looks good so far. And once everything kind of checks out with a final load attached, then... Uh, then I'll swap out the rectifiers, and uh, then we can work on trying to get a picture out of this thing. Okay, so here we are back on the test bench. We've got all the electrolytics changed out, and we're going to see if we can now get a full-size raster, which we were not capable of before. And if we can get a full-size raster and our deflection issues are resolved, then we can move on to other more important things. <clears throat> but uh, now that we've got all the electrolytics in and cleaned up and we've relocated the B fuse and stuff like that, that's that's nice. So let's uh, plug it in and see if it blows up. All right, so here's that pucker moment. Filaments come up. Let's 
Let's see if we get sweep. Hey, hey, we do. Full size even. And we definitely have some linearity issues. That doesn't really surprise me, does it? Let's see if we can... Get a tool in here. We got big scan lines here, so that's good. That's a little better, a little more normal looking. Let's adjust our vertical linearity. Just got to find the right screwdriver. Yeah, the yoke needs to be adjusted, but we can do that in the finals. I'm trying to get the vertical dialed in a little bit better because it's compressed here, but it is uh, expanded elsewhere. I can hear the corona arcing inside of the picture tube shell. Yeah, so that's a little more normal at the bottom. And let's adjust the linearity for the top. Looking much better. Okay. So we now have full deflection. That makes me pretty happy. So now what I need to do is focus on uh, the IF strip and the tuner. But as you can see, we have a full size raster there. Very good. So we've been waiting for this moment for a while. This is, and that CRT is nice and bright. That's a zero hour CRT right there. There's maybe five minutes on a total right now. So with any luck, this set will outlive the most, most of us. So now we got to focus on pulling that board. I'm still going to change out the rectifiers and the remaining two black beauty caps that are in there that I missed the first time. Looking pretty good. And once we can validate that the IF and the tuner section work, then we can get it back in the cabinet and we can work on the final adjustments. So this is all pretty exciting right now. It's been a long time coming. And I bet the owner is going to be excited to see this on video that he's got a full screen bright raster right there. So it's just now a matter of working on the IF and the tuner. And then we'll dial everything in and it should be a pretty sweet set. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this segment of the series. Thanks for watching the video, and more stuff to come.